Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to SETI Live from the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California. My name is Simon Steele. I'm the Senior Director of Education Outreach at the SETI Institute. And um, I'm gonna be talking today to Dr. Frank Machis. Uh, we'd like to apologize in advance that our main speaker, um, uh, Dr. Dirk schultz makuch uh, could not be available today because of some technical issues, but uh, Frank is a wonderful second choice, uh, <laughs> first choice in many ways. Um, uh, he is the senior planetary astronomer at the SETI Institute. So um, we are going to talk today about results from, from uh, Dirk's paper on um, super, super habitable planets, uh, super habitable Earth-like planets uh, in our galaxy. So I think a good place to start, Frank, is actually to define for everybody what is a super habitable planet, because I can barely say it this time of morning. Good morning. Sorry, I was mute. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and we forgot to introduce Bess, who is here with us ah. today as a special guest to bring some kind of uh, exterior space perspective on the on the process of super habitability mm -hmm. so it's a very complicated word to say first of all so i'm gonna have to <laughs> practice this one super habitable so i'm not a co-author of this paper but i thought it was a very fascinating paper and uh, i think that's a very a great topic of conversation for us today so what is a super habitable planet well if you look uh, earth is habitable definitely because we are here okay and uh, we have a biosphere but um, in fact, if you look at the history of our planet, there was some times where the planet was not really habit habitable per se, uh, because of high radiation level, because of, uh, for instance, the snowball effect. We may remember that uh, we talked about this in the past, 800 million years ago, the temperature of Earth dropped significantly and uh, Earth become kind of a gigantic icy world. And also we have this, uh, catastrophic events that happen, like uh, the most famous one happened 65 million years ago when dinosaurs would get wiped out together with 80% uh, of the biosphere. And those kind of events happened a large number of times, in fact, in our, uh, in our um, evolution. Yeah, at, least, at least five, I think there are yeah, five major five events six. and possibly six. Yes. So this paper is basically try to think about now we know we have 4,000 uh, exoplanets in the galaxy. We, we, have the, we, have seen, we have not seen them, but we have the characteristic of those planets. Among those planets, which one could be super habitable? So what super habitable means? That's the question I'm assuming, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, good. And before we actually uh, give that piece of information to everybody, um, I'm just like to, to first of all welcome people who are listening in. We've already got uh, people coming in from the Czech Republic, from Ohio, uh, from Paris, uh, Kingston, California, rather than Kingston upon Thames, which is my home territory, um, and India. So welcome everyone. Please do let us know where you're listening in from. And also, uh, if you have any questions uh, for Frank or Beth, please do send them in. Uh, Rebecca McDonald is here behind the scenes collating the questions and and we'll get to asking questions in a little while but let's get let's get back to the the as you say earth is habitable obviously we're all sitting here um so if we wanted to tick box for another habitable world uh what sort of things will we be looking for even something that's habitable let alone super habitable so for world to be habitable uh this paper basically is considering habitability in comparison with Earth, okay? So everything is based on the habitability of Earth. Our planet is more habitable in some specific, specific parts, specific part of, of, our, of, uh, the, of our latitude, for instance. There is more life in the tropics. There is life in the middle of the Sahara. This is because there is more water and more moisture and higher temperature in the tropics. So this is, based, for instance, discussed in, in, the, in this paper. Mm -hmm. So there is two things that we need to consider for superhabitability is the star itself and the planet. So let's start with the star. So stars are very different. The galaxy has, uh, the last number I got was 300 million or 450 million stars in our galaxy, billion stars in our <laughs> galaxy. Have. This is a number that changed a lot. So I'm kind of getting back to it. <laughs> but, among those stars, uh, we have the gigantic one, OAB type star. 
And then we have the, the sun-like star, the G-types, we call them. And then we have those M dwarf, which are very numerous, very uh, live, live, uh, long life expectancy. This paper discuss this and basically discard quickly OAB star because of the radiation, because they're extremely massive and they have very short lifetime, uh, typically of the hundred of less than 100 million years. And then talks about uh, M-type star. So M-type stars are great. Uh, we have a lot of them in the galaxy, but M-type star are known to have what we call solar flares and um, the type of activity and the top of that, a star in the, in, close to a uh, uh, M-type star will be tidally locked. So we will not be able to rotate like our planet. Mm. So the author discarded M-type star. So we have now FGK type stars. So, so, there's a, so there's a sort of Goldilocks star as well as a Goldilocks world is what you're saying. We've got this sequence of stars, the very hot bright ones that blow up in about a few million years to so the, the little red ones that are going on forever. Um, and it's the Goldilocks, these, these type uh, F, G and K. And thank you very much, Harvard University or Harvard Observatory for this wonderfully silly uh, classification of stars. Um, uh, that, that are around long enough and, and have all the right properties. At least we think so. Um, uh, for, so they for, talk about, in the paper, planets. they basically say that K-type star, dwarf K-type star, are typically the type of star that will host super habitable planets mm -hmm. because of the stability, first of all, of the activity of the star, and also because of the temperature, and finally because of the lack of... Uh, extremely energetic um, outbursts that could sterilize the surface. Mm -hmm. So they focus on K-type stars. Mm -hmm. Then the other thing, of course, is uh, we, we mentioned the Goldilocks planets, and there's a Goldilocks zone around a planet. Beth, can you say a little bit about uh, the, the, the habitable zone as well? I mean, um, you know, Mercury is going around a very nice G-type star at the moment, but, but that's not a place where we're going to look for, for rivers and palm trees. Well, I, I have taken to not using the term Goldilocks zone because it's it's sort of a misnomer these days. Um, what it started out as was this area around a star where you could have liquid water, it would be the right temperature. So, but that was simply based on the distance from the star and, and the, the assumption of how much heat that it gets. Uh, we've actually expanded that definition just a little bit to include a, a whole host of factors. But when we talk about ha habitability, generally speaking, everybody's talking about, is there liquid water for life? Because we know we need it here. And this being the only example of life that we have, that's what we kind of have to go on is, is what we have on Earth. So um, it started with just the liquid water and now it's starting to include things like, does it you know, can it have a magnetic field? Uh, how much radiation does the sun put out? As Frank mentioned, you know, solar flares make a big difference. Uh, if you're too close in, even though you can have liquid water, but you're getting hit by constantly by solar flares, it doesn't really make it habitable either. So um, the, the basic definition is just that, that search for liquid water is where we've kind of started off. We're adding other factors in, but that's the only one we can really determine just from the distance from the star. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, we, we've got a, a few more people listening in from Poole in England, London, Albuquerque, New Mexico, Norway, Wales, Manila, Tucson, Bolivia, Nebraska, Boston, Massachusetts, uh, Japan, Portugal, and, and, and Copenhagen. Welcome, everybody. Um, Frank, let's go back. Uh, so we've got the right star. Okay, it's like a sort of putting a recipe together, isn't it? We've got the star, we've maybe maybe got a distance. Tell us a little bit about the planet itself. What do we want from, from this planet? So we don't we want a planet which is terrestrial. Um, so we discarded first every giant gaseous planet, Neptune-like planet, the icy giants. So that's only now we have Earth and Super Earth. So the paper argue on the fact that the mass of Earth is not, opt is not optimal for life. If Earth was slightly bigger, Earth will be able to get more, uh, to keep more atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And atmosphere is, are extremely important because they basically provide uh, an atmosphere for species to, uh, to breathe. And also because atmosphere is generally being um, um, uh, moved away by the activity of the sun. 
So the denser is the atmosphere, the initial atmosphere, the better for life because it's a stability. It's, it's, it's kind of a stability for the system. Mm -hmm. So the paper basically, after discussing this effect, uh, the, the the reason for which you want an, a large, uh, a significant atmosphere denser than Earth, and also you want to have we can talk about that radioactive activity in the heart of the of the planet. Um, reach the value of 1.5 to 1.6 Earth masses mm -hmm. Earth, to, be, to be optimal for uh, uh, habitability. Mm -hmm. So it's rocky, it's slightly more massive, gives you more atmosphere. Is that sort of like asking for too much of a good thing? I mean, there is a, a terrestrial planet with a lot of atmosphere. It's called Venus, and, and that's not a great place at the moment. Um, so it, it, uh, what is there any sort of modeling that goes on to to think about the atmospheres of these giant planets these giant earths so there is modeling mentioned in the paper about uh, uh, venus is given is given as an example a counter example of that yeah. but what they decided to do is to have a very restrictive uh, definition of the habitable zone as you probably know there is two kind of the definition of the habitable zone and venus in one of them venus is just at the edge in the other one, Venus is completely out. So they decided to use the most restrictive one by Konuparu and, uh, and focus only on the star, which are really inside, in the middle of the habitable zone. Mm -hmm. So avoiding the case of uh, an extreme, um, extremely dense atmosphere like we have for Venus. Mm -hmm. That's the solution mm -hmm. they use. Right. So we got, uh, we got a good location, we got a good star, and then there's one other aspect, uh, Beth, isn't there? Because it's taken quite a while for, for us humans to start building radio telescopes on this planet. You know, it's taken life a good four billion years to actually uh, uh, get these projects running. Uh, say a little bit about this third parameter, which is, which is age. Right. So the, the paper looks at these planets and is looking at ones that are in the range of five to eight billion years old, which of course is older than our own Earth's 4.5 billion years. So what they're looking at is they're, they're talking about how quickly life can evolve, how long it has, how much diversification it can get. And in that longer time frame, you can get a much more diverse population of planetary life, not just anything necessarily humanoid, but everything else, the whole wide range of it. So that's kind of where I think a lot of the, the, the quote, super habitability is coming from, is the fact that these planets are Earth-like to the extent that they have liquid water and they get enough radiation and all of that, but also that they've had this this larger amount of time, this thicker atmosphere, those two things go into, now they can develop life more quickly, hang on to it for longer and possibly diversify to the point where, you know, now we have a chance to actually maybe see them have developed radio signals earlier, you know, earlier than we did, or, you know, they, they've gotten more technologically advanced in that time because they've been around longer than we have. So we actually have a chance there. And uh, that's, I think, what's kind of fascinating about that. Okay. Now, Frank, re take us through this, this table that you've brought up. Yes. So this table is basically a summary of what they call a superhabitable planet. They call that the most valuable planets. So that's basically what we discuss, K-type star, five to eight billion years old, 1.5 more, uh, more massive than Earth, about 10% larger than Earth. Then the temperature, and that's interesting, they decided to search for planets which are, for which the temperature would be five degrees Celsius higher than the temperature on Earth in average. The reasoning for this is because there is more life in, tropic, in the tropics on Earth that there is in the in temperate area. So if you want a place to be super habitable, you, you need to have a higher temperature. So that's this five degrees Celsius here. And then they discuss as well the composition of the atmosphere um, and the presence of a moon. And I finally, the, 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 necess the necessary plate tectonic. Mm -hmm. Because if you have plate tectonic, you don't have the recycle of uh, the silicate carbon, which stabilize the climate for a long period of time. And the moon is important. And this is kind of controversial at the moment because the moon provides some kind of stability of the obliquity of the planet mm -hmm. over, over time. So that's the reason they put this as a parameter for the most valuable planets. But that's so a theoretical a, assumption. 
Go ahead, sorry. Right, because as you say, we've, we've at the moment only got a sample size of one. We don't know how long life on average evolves. You know, you, you could have intelligent beings evolving in a, in a billion years, or it may on average take 12 billion years, in which case, you know, we are one of the few because we, we got things fast. So, uh, Beth. Uh, of course, and as Frank mentioned uh, at the sort of at the beginning, you know, we also have this whole thing. One of the reasons that we, uh, one of the potential reasons that we diversified, are all those uh, extinction events that we've had, because you know when you talk about, we don't know what happened to cause the Cambrian explosion, and then there's the Permian die-off, which takes out ninety-five percent of all marine life. It's followed rather quickly by another extinction event that mm -hmm. seems to take out a whole bunch more, but that allows that biology to open up. Mm -hmm. And because of, we think now, because of that, that second one, that that's kind of what introduced the potential for dinosaurs, which of course, those mm -hmm. become birds. So that actually sort of becomes that, our modern ecosystem. So, you know, how protected is your planet? Do you need these extinction events to continue to diversify life as well? Mm -hmm. So there's, there's so many pieces to this puzzle that that I find it interesting that they've like they've narrowed it down to a list, and we can really only we only have visibility in about four items on that list. <laughs> right, we'll come back to that in a second. But, but you're they, right. They um, call what you described best, they call that the planetary history in the paper. It's a very mm -hmm. small chapter where they basically say yes, we don't really know the impact of an history of a planet on the development of a biosphere. Yeah, from the system we know. Earth, we know that we need to have those massive transformation to have la complex life to develop. So that's yeah. another part of the complexity of, uh, of the development of intelligent life in a, on, on planets. Although these, these, these uh, mass extinction events, uh, uh, asteroid impacts, uh, uh, tectonic activity, massive volcanic eruptions, um, these are will be pretty standard on on a developing planet. It's not like you know there's some freak event. I mean, the, the Earth has been hit, as we know, many times by very large large bodies. Uh, we know that there have been a whole sequence of of, of major volcanic um, uh, events on the planet that have caused caused extinction. So th this is presumably going to happen with any sort of terrestrial planet that has a reasonable sort of te tectonic activity and is surrounded by all this stuff floating around the solar system. So, so, so you know, it won't happen in the same order. Uh, we may ha well have turkeys ruling another planet, in which which puts a different spin on Thanksgiving. But uh, you know, it's a, it's it's quite possible that the, the other planets are, are having these these effects as well. Uh, Frank. The, the discovery of these these um, uh, super Earths. Say a little bit about that. Is this uh, what missions, what telescopes have made these discoveries? Yeah. So basically, I anticipated these questions. I'm showing you here the figure where basically they compile all the list of all the 4,500 extra exoplanets that we know so far. And among those 4,500 exoplanets, 3,000 of them, even more, I think, 3,500, have been detected by the Kepler spacecraft. Mm -hmm. So those are detection, are transit, transit detection, meaning that we don't see the planet, we see the shadow of the planet as the planet is passing between us and the host star. And from this small attenuation, we derive the orbit of the planet. And from the size, from the duration of the attenuation, we derive as well, for the depth of the attenuation, we derive as well the size of the, of the, size of the planet. Mm -hmm. So that's this diagram is showing is basically the semi-major axis, which is the distance of the planet to the star, and the mass of the of the star here. Okay. And what you can see is all these tiny dots are in fact uh, planets, and the color of the dots correspond to the temperature of the star of the planet, and the thick and the and the size of the dots correspond to the size of the planet. Right. So, so as far as colors of those dots are concerned, we're interested in the sort of um, the yellowish uh, green ones. I, 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 my exactly. screen is not big enough to see the, the stuff in the middle, but yeah. Okay. This, the square here correspond to the yes. super habitable. Right. Fair okay. definition. Okay. Well, uh, just to say, we've got a few questions coming in. We'll turn this over to questions from the audience in a second. We also received a donation. So I'd like to say briefly, this is a, 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 an advertising commercial break. Uh, the SETI Institute is a nonprofit organization, and we do rely on, on, on public donations to, to, to um, uh, keep the coffee flowing in. So uh, thank you so much for the donation uh, for that. 
uh, person or that family, wonderful. Uh, this is what we need to, to actually keep us keep us on air and keep these wonderful discussions about uh, astronomy and life in the universe going. So there is, there is a donation button. Uh, that's all I'm going to say about money. Um, but uh, again, thank you so much for, for that donation. Um, we'll turn over to questions in a second from the audience. But I would like to say, you know, a lot of this is, is we're talking about, you know, uh, birds taking over these these giant planets and everything. Really, and we, we don't know much at all beyond the mass and location of these worlds do we and what's what's the next what's the next phase what how are we going to find out if there is oxygen how are we going to right. find out if there's life the next phase is to analyze planetary atmospheres and that's really the goal of of uh, these bigger telescopes that we have coming out um, everybody's sort of hinging their hopes on the JWST and and what it's going to be able to see once it's up there and that you know, we are starting to get some exoplanetary atmosphere research coming out. People are starting to look into it. They're starting to look into what colors the atmosphere could be, what uh, is contained within the atmosphere. Um, we found a lot of very cool things with, with metal, um, but finding ones that are more oxygen and nitrogen based has been a challenge. So, you know, let's let's get that big telescope up there so we can so we can actually start looking at those again. Right. I think so the, the current the launch paper, date is, is the 31st of October for James Webb. So very, very exciting. <laughs> so in the paper, they, they, they show, uh, they give a list of 25 uh, super habitable exoplanets based on the definition they gave in the stable. Okay. And that's the figure I, sh uh, I can show you this figure. It's not that interesting because it's a bunch of dots, but can you see it here? Is it? Yes. Yeah. So it's basically the uh, it's basically the um, I, I cannot see it, but um, I need to turn my head because on my side is, is tilted. But it's it's basically show you the the location of the super habitable planet in the diagram I showed you before. But what is very interesting here is that they also collected some compiled information from the Kepler uh, spacecraft to get to know a bit more about those exoplanets. So let me show you the table with a lot of numbers, but you know, we're fascinated by numbers when in this field. So here it is. So those are the 24 exoplanets, super habitable exoplanets identified. They don't have names. So they name KOI for Kepler Object of Interest. The planet candidates, most of them, a few of them has been confirmed. What is very disappointed, and I'm sorry to uh, kind of put apart, to kind of break the party here, but it's not, they're far away. They're so far away. <laughs> the closest one is 100 light years away from us. Mm -hmm. So we are talking about worlds which are so distant that we will not be able to characterize them, mm -hmm. I think those ones specifically, even with James Webb Space Telescope, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But the fact that they exist, it's great news already. So it means that we will find more of them and hopefully we will find some closer. And that's really what TESS is going to do. Test the mission launched by NASA, which has been in operation for two years now, mapping and trying to find exoplanets, transiting exoplanets around star nearby us, will probably find also super habitable exoplanets. Mm -hmm. And in this case, because they're close to us, we will be able to observe them with the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, not them directly, but at least see the detect the atmosphere and get direct information about this, uh, the composition of the atmosphere and maybe find biomarkers. Mm -hmm. And that's really the motivation, I think, of this research. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, uh, we can't get the atmospheric spectra for stars this distance, um, hundreds or even thousands of light years. Nevertheless, you can turn a radio telescope to these, these planets and there's a possibility of, of technosignature um, uh, detections from these because uh, radio telescope facilities like Arecibo and, and the VLA um, can reach out to these distances to detect strong technosignatures. Uh, that's, that's maybe a, another tale to tell, but uh, there, there's certainly probably an interest in, in doing that from the SETI community. That's, yeah, that's what SETI would probably do. That's what the SETI <laughs> research group will do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's assuming that 8, mil, 8 billion years, a civilization which, has, which is on a planet which is 8 billion years old, 
still use radio signal to communicate. So that's yeah. another topic of conversation that we can have if you want. <laughs> yeah, maybe they're into retro stuff. Who knows? But uh, um, so we got some questions coming in. I'm going to uh, read these out. So this is a free for all, whoever wants to grab them. Um, first question uh, is, why do we look for water on other planets when looking for life? Isn't it possible that life there doesn't require the stuff, um, but doesn't require water? Is, is a, uh, the, This could be taken up by a biologist. Who wants to have a go at that one? Uh, basically, again, it goes back to we have a sample size of one. We know that things here require water. Um, so that's what we look for. There are some scientists who are reaching out into uh, a little bit more diversity on the biology side and, and looking to see if there are other ways that life could form and exist. But again, it's really hard to test for something you don't know. Mm -hmm. And I will just add that we, uh, we know that our planet, as soon as liquid water appeared on our planet 3.8 billion years ago, life appeared as well. So it seems to have some kind of correlation between liquid water and life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Seems you need a liquid around to move the molecules. Otherwise, it's just going to sit there. Uh, that's the, I think that's as long as you have some sort of, some sort of fluid. And, and water is a very common one. So it's a good one to, to, to focus on. So uh, next question. Um, this is about oxygen. What if the super Earth exoplanets have less oxygen than humans require in their atmosphere? because our Earth went through an oxidation event uh, that made it suitable for us. Um, would you think such events would take place in even those exoplanets and would support human life? So this is a question on the, basically on the evolution of our atmosphere um, and oxygen, uh, which, is, which is a very volatile molecule, a very, very reactive molecule, and, and only exists on the surface of the Earth because it's being made by, by life. Yeah. Um, the, on Earth, the oxygen appear. I mean, oxygen was on Earth, but oxygen in the atmosphere appear uh, during the great oxygen oxygenation event, which was 2.4 billion years ago, mm -hmm. right? Before that, we had life on Earth, but it was not the same type of life. Right. Um, in the table of this paper, they list some kind of uh, different type of environmental parameters, and they show that... Um, we can have life with or without oxygen. And talking about simple life, monocellular life, like bacteria, uh, eukaryotes, etc. Of course, for complex life, we don't really know because we go back to this problem that we are a system of one, and we don't know if we could have a complex life living without uh, oxygen. Um, best, maybe you have some, some great answer here on this topic, but that's all I can say in my case. No, I don't. I don't have anything more than that. It's it comes back down to that sample of one, and and what we know is is basically just what we have here. And I would just add that one of the reason we are uh, this we are we're going to focus on super habitable or habitable planet is to expand this sample of one. <clears throat> Imagine that we find uh, in five years, we or even less in three years, we're probably going to have a super habitable planet planet. Uh, which is something like 10 light years, 50 light years away from us, right? Mm -hmm. So we are going to look at this planet more carefully. We're going, we're going to use all these techniques we have, ground-based telescopes, space telescopes, to characterize the atmosphere of this planet. And that will reveal, may reveal, for instance, the presence of a large amount of oxygen or not. And that will basically give us some answer whether or not the great oxygenation is something that will happen everywhere or is something that is basically only Earth in the history of Earth. We are basically starting this research at the moment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's a question, a uh, TRAPPIST-1 has come up in the, in the questions. And of course, that, that's, that's around a, an M star. Any, any, any updates on, on TRAPPIST-1 while, while somebody's asking about it? Because it is a pretty cool system. Are they, uh, are they super Earths? They're, they're not super, are they? They're sort of Earths. I, I think they're all pretty much around. What else? Um, well, it's also. Trappist one is also that the in that uh, red dwarf star category mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that becomes a, a problem with uh, the extreme radiation, so mm -hmm. X rays and ultraviolet. Um, not sure if anything new has come out of it. I kind of feel like if if anybody's doing research on it, it seems to have been. It, nothing's come out yet. It, there, no, it, nothing's come out of this at the moment. Uh, more than what we are we know so far. Mm -hmm. um, 
there was some study that showed that the star Trappist one had a flare, uh, something like 10 or 15 years ago, which is not good for life over there. Mm -hmm. uh, there is some models which have been developed to show whether or not this uh, system, uh, this uh, system could have uh, an atmosphere if they're tidally locked or not. Uh, mm -hmm. Papers, theoretical papers, being published on this topic. But the team who discovered Traspis One started a new project called Speculos. And Speculos is basically the same telescope, but on steroid, uh, better, uh, capable of, det of detecting more of those M dwarf uh, planets around M dwarf stars. And uh, it's been in operation for a year and a half now. They did not find anything yet. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. hopefully they will find more of those systems. Once again, this is a very different, it's going to be, if we have life on those Trappist-1 Trappist stars, uh, planets, they will be very, this will be a very different life because mm -hmm. the M-type star is different in color, in temperature, uh, there is radiation, the planets may be tidally locked. So that's very like an extreme environment compared mm -hmm. to Earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So question about imaging. Uh, an exoplanet, uh, of course, uh, Kepler does not image the exoplanet. It looks at variations in, in brightness of the star. Um, how soon, this is the question, how soon um, do you think uh, we'll be able to image, directly image one of these super Earths? And, and if we haven't got the technology now, what sort of technology would you need to do it? I can answer oh. to that because that's I, was, my <laughs> I was gonna say that, that this is all Frank right here. <laughs> So we are working on developing instruments to, to image uh, exoplanets. In fact, we have now instruments capable of imaging uh, Jupiter-sized exoplanets uh, in Chile, the GPI instrument, in uh, Hawaii, Skekseo on Subaru telescope. Those, teles those instruments will be able to, uh, are able to image uh, Jupiter-sized exoplanets, which are a million times fainter than the star. Here we're talking about Earth-like super Earths they are a billion times fainter than the stars. Mm -hmm. So that's a very difficult problem. But we could build easily an instrument capable of detecting those planets around nearby star in the visible or in the mid infrared. Um, in the visible, we can do it from space. In fact, there is a project called Project Blue, which is exactly that, is to design a small spacecraft the size of a fridge, American fridge, um, That's big. Yeah, a bit small. <laughs> it's, it's big for a European, but it's yeah. <laughs> and this telescope will stare continuously at Alpha Centauri A and then Alpha Centauri B. It's a binary system of two G-type stars. And this system could detect an Earth-like exoplanet in orbit around them after like 10,000 hours of observations or 4,000. Mm -hmm. And then on the ground, we are also building those extremely large telescopes. The, the, the TMT is one of them. Uh, the European Large Telescope is another one. And those will be able to detect exoplanets like Earth use in the mid-infrared. We have the technology to do that now. What is missing is the program, the money, and maybe the ambition of, the, of those nations to really do that. But we will. And 10, 15 years, I think we will have the first picture of an Earth-like exoplanet. Okay, wonderful. Uh, we're wrapping up now, um, but a question for each of you. How long before we find life on, on one of the... Is, is this the, you know, is a super Earth where you would look? Let's put it that way. Beth, uh, if you had a choice, um, where, where would, what sort of planet would you look? Would you be going back to the M dwarfs? Or are you happy with super Earths? What, what were you thinking if you had to put your money... I'm still kind of hoping for that that incredibly Earth-like planet. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, around the same type of star, same distance, same size. Mm -hmm. That's that's my hope. We're getting closer. We're getting closer. I think we've got planets that are close to the right size, planets that are around the right stars, and I think we're going to get that combination soon. So, I'm okay. I'm hoping in the next five to ten years we're going to find that. Okay, so a, an M class is what you're saying in Star Trek parlance. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Frank, what about you? Are you, you excited about Super Earths so or is this where you'd low look? Um, for me, what's very important is that we find a planet like Earth or Super Earth around a G-type star. I mean, mm -hmm. I like Trappist-1, it's exciting result, but imagine that if we find a planet which is habitable, 
and around that aim type style, it will take years and years of study, theoretical studies to understand the biology on this planet because the biology will be significantly dif different. Mm -hmm. Just the vegetation will be different on an M, M dwarf planet. So around an M dwarf planet. Mm -hmm. So I personally prefer that we focus on G, K type star, which are the same type of light. We have so many of them. There's 12% of K type star in our galaxy. So that's a lot, okay? Mm -hmm. We're talking about millions, 100 million of stars like that. And we focus on those. We search for Earth-like exoplanet or super Earth. If there is one in the habitable zone, we build instrument to image those or uh, to, to uh, analyze the atmosphere. And that, I think that's the direction because then we will find life, which is, I think, comparable to our life that we'll be seeing ourselves in the past or in the future. Wonderful. Well, thank you both for this conversation. Uh, thank you, Dirk, uh, in absentia for writing this paper. That's wonderful, fascinating stuff. I'd just like to advertise that tonight, um, 7 p.m. Pacific, we have uh, SETI Talks, a monthly talk about Venus and the possibilities of life and the controversies of observations. Um, so please join us tonight. The, the information about that is on the SETI Institute website. So until then, uh, thank you both. Thank you, everybody, for for listening in. It's been a pleasure and we'll speak to you soon.